Hi, I'm Kenny Yates. Welcome to Hold the Hope. And this is our regular weekly message. And today we are wrapping up our two part series or our two part mini series entitled Harvest Time. This message today I've called Reaping Your Harvest. I believe we're living in what the, the Bible or the scripture call the end times. It's only the great tribulation, the rebellion of the temple in Jerusalem, and the rapture left to come. All things are set for a one world government to take rule. And I believe that already there is a one world shadow government that is ruling. It's already in place. It's already given or orders. The days of individual sovereign governments are over. It's finished. It's no more. The conspiracy theories are no longer theories. They are now proven facts, if you would be willing to accept it. The world's governments are all marching to the same beat, speaking with one voice and saying the same things. All the all huge Fortune 500 companies and all the publicly traded companies have the same MO of when it com comes to politics or social agendas. They're all saying the same things. They're all doing the same things. They're all in one beat. And it just makes you wonder, is that a coincidence that the world's governments, the world's companies, everybody's doing the same thing? fighting for the same thing, saying the same thing. Is that just a coincidence? I, for one, I don't believe so. I believe that there's a hand over there, over everything, a shadow government that's running the world. So the bottom line is this. If you have a harvest coming to you, now is the only time left for you to reap that harvest. This side of eternity is quickly coming to a close. It will soon be over. Jesus is on his way. So with that said, turn with me please to our scripture. It's found in 2 Samuel chapter 21, verse 1 through 6. Now there was a famine in the days of David for three years, year after year. And David sought the face of the Lord. And the Lord said, There is blood guilt on Saul and on his house, because he put the Gibeonites to death. So the king said, called the, the Gibeonites and spoke to them. Now the Gibeonites were not of the people of Israel, but of the remnant of the Amorites. Although the people of Israel had sworn to spare them, Saul had sought to strike them down in his zeal, zeal for the people of Israel and Judah. And David said to the Gibeonites, What shall I do for you? And how shall I make atonement that you may bless the heritage of the Lord? The Gibeonites said to him, It is not a matter of silver or gold between us and Saul or his house. Neither is it for us to put any man to death in Israel. And David said, What do you say that I shall do for you? They said to the king, The man who consumed us and planned to destroy us so that we should have no place in all the territory of Israel, let seven of his sons be given to us, so that we may hang them before the Lord of Gibeah, of Saul, the chosen of the Lord. And the king said, I will give them. Now the scripture said that there was a famine for three years, year after year, meaning there was no relief, a constant drought, a time of no harvest. Regular prayers were not helping. And the seed and farine was doing no good. Regular fighting of the, of the enemy brought no relief. The nations around them were, they were prospering, but there was famine in Israel. So what did King David do? The scripture said that King David sought the face of God. He, fought, he sought the face 
of the Lord. He went to him to find out what was wrong, what was causing the famine. Why is everybody else prospering, but we are in the famine, Lord, and we are your chosen people. We are blessed of the Lord, but yet we are in this famine and everybody else is prospering. Where is our harvest? King David understood that something was wrong. This was no regular famine. This was a judgment famine. You know, some Christians are in a time of famine, even right now, but they refuse to believe that it could be caused by something in their past. There might be some pact that a distant relative might have made with the enemy who has who, who now that the enemy now has a legal entry into your life and has exercised that right and is now wreaking havoc in your life as a result. You must understand that the way our earthly lives are governed is governed by rules, it's governed by regulations, it's governed by laws of the land. So are our spiritual lives. They are there are rules that we, we must adhere to. They're, 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 our lives are governed by spiritual laws that are in place. Look at this, Ephesians chapter four, verse 25 through 27. Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger and give no opportunity to the devil. You know, some theologians discount the, the understanding of these two verses to mean giving legal right to the devil to operate in our lives. They erroneously believe that if that is the case, then we would be possessed by a demon. But that is not the case at all. David and the Israelites were not possessed by Satan, but yet Satan used it to cause a famine and stop their harvest from coming in. Things can stop, or, or the devil can stop your harvest because of something in your past. He doesn't have to possess you. You don't have to be possessed by the, by the devil for him to operate in your life, to stop your harvest, or, or, or to stop your, your forward advance. And that is what is happening, or, or that same thing can be happening in our lives today. Maybe we're going through a famine and the enemy is stealing your increase. Every time our harvest comes in, the enemy swoops in and steals it. We're, we're doing what we're supposed to be doing, yet our harvest is always being stolen by the enemy. If that is the case, then maybe there is a legal spiritual opening in your life. Seek God and he will tell you what it, what, what's wrong. We are to leave no room for the, de for, for the enemy, but we're to leave room for God to bring conviction or, or to point out something that's in our past that has opened a door a legal door for legal entry for the enemy to get in. Something either you yourself have done or one of your ancestors might have done. Maybe it could be witchcraft, maybe it's alcoholism, or maybe some type of riotous living, but something could be in your past that needs to be taken care of. See, in King David's case, and Israel's case, it wasn't even one of King David's ancestors. It was his predecessor. King Saul was the guilty party. He was guilty of breaking the covenant that Joshua had made with the Gibeonites, which opened the door for that attack, for, for the enemy to come in and steal their harvest. The scripture says that although the people of Israel had sworn to spare them, Saul had sought to strike them down in his seal for the people of Israel and Judah. You see, sometimes in our zeal for the Lord, we think that we might be doing something good and when, when it is a spiritual violation. Like maybe we forsake our family or maybe we forsake our spouse in our zeal for the Lord. Now, we do not love 
our family. We do not love our spouse more than we love God. But we are not to neglect them. We are not to forsake them and ignore them in our zeal for the Lord. We are to put the Lord first and everything else second without forsaking or ignoring our family. Forsaking or ignoring our spouse. King David got his harvest after he made amends for King, King Saul's transgressions. Now, we're not allowed to, to, to shed blood. We're not allowed to give life for the sake of reconciliation. But what we are allowed to do, we are allowed to plead the blood of Jesus. We are allowed to pray. We are allowed to intercede. We can, get, we can get ready for a spiritual warfare. We can declare war on the enemy just like he has declared war on us. And we can begin to pray to Almighty God. And when we begin to pray to God, he begins to move. Look at what Ephesians chapter 6 verse 12 says. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Did you see that? Did you see what Paul wrote? Paul said that we do not wrestle against flesh and blood. He did not say that we do not wrestle, period. But instead he said we do not wrestle against flesh and blood. Now Paul wrote that under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And the way that it is written, it expects us to be in the wrestling match. So Paul is giving us direction on who it is that we are supposed to be wrestling against. So that we are not wrestling any and everybody. It is not the driver that just cut us off in traffic that we are wrestling against. It is not our boss who is a tyrant that we're wrestling against. It's not even the world leaders who are blindly led by an unseen hand to impoverish the world and subject every man and every woman and every child upon the earth to, 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 to slavery. It's not even them. What it is, it's the enemy, it's the spirit. Spiritual rulers, the rulers against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in heavenly places. Those are the ones that we are wrestling against. I looked up the word wrestle and this is what Webster's New World Dictionary said. To struggle hand to hand with an opponent in an attempt to throw or force him or her to the ground without striking blows. We are not in a physical fist fight. We are in a spiritual struggle for, for our very souls and the souls of our loved ones, as well as the souls of those around us, our neighbors, our co-workers, our friends. So whether you're wrestling or not, you are in the ring. And if you do not fight back, if you do not wrestle back, you will be pinned and your harvest will be taken from you. You will be left to wonder why. You'll be left to wonder what's going on. You'll be left to wonder where is my harvest? I want you to watch this. Acts chapter 12 verse 1. Through three. At that time, Herod the king laid violent hands on some who belonged to the church. He killed James, the brother of John, with the sword. And when he saw that it pleased the Jews, he proceeded to arrest Peter also. This was during the days of unleavened bread. Herod arrested John's brother, James. He, James was one of the inner circle, the three inner circle of Jesus' disciples. And he put James to death with the sword, and it pleased the Jews. So, so Herod went and he then arrested Peter. But did you notice that during that time when, when um, he arrested James, the church, or the scriptures makes no mention of the church 
interceding or even praying for James. Maybe they didn't have time to pray for James. Maybe it happened so quickly that they were caught unawares. And before they realized what was going on, James was dead. So Henry went ahead and had Peter arrested. Had Peter thrown in prison. Had him chained up and locked behind bars. And because it was the Feast of Unleavened Bread, he couldn't kill Peter. So he had to wait until the feast was over. And that is where he made his mistake. Because now the church had time. The church began to intercede for Peter. They, they remember what happened to James. And there's no mention of prayer for him. So they began to intercede for Peter. You see, Herod was about to kill Peter just like he killed James. But the church, I said, but the church, but the church called a prayer meeting. They gathered themselves together. And the scripture said that they began to earnestly seek the face of God on Peter's behalf. I want us to continue reading that account. Acts chapter 12, verse 4 and 5. And when he had seized him, he put him in prison, delivering him over to four squads of soldiers to guard him, intending after the Passover to bring him out to the people. So Peter was kept in prison, but earnest prayer for him was made to God by the church. The church went to war for Peter. It seemed like they had learned their lessons from what happened to James. James was murdered, and they didn't recognize James was arrested at the time. Maybe. Either way, the church was not prepared to just let Peter die without a fight. They were ready to intercede for their leader, G um, Peter. I don't know if Peter would have survived that, that encounter with Herod if the church had not interceded for him. But let us take a look at what happened when the church decided to pray. Acts chapter 12, verse 6 through 10. And when Herod was about to bring him out, on that very night, Peter was sleeping between two soldiers, bound with two chains, and sentries before the door were guarding the prison. And behold, an angel of the Lord stood next to him, and a light shone in the cell. He struck Peter in the side and woke him, saying, Get up quickly, and the chains fell off his hands. And the angel said to him, Dress yourself and put on your sandals. And he did so. And he said to him, Wrap your cloak around you and follow me. And he went out and followed him. He did not know that what was, was being done by the angel was real, but thought he was seeing a vision. When they had passed the first and the second guard, they came to the, to the iron gate leading into the city. It opened for them of its own accord. And they went out and went along one street, and immediately the angel left them. The prayer, their prayer, the prayers of the church loosen those chains. They open those prison doors. They set the captives free. It brought about the harvest that they had desired. Praise the Lord for prayer. Praise the Lord for intercessory. There is nothing that can take the place of effectual fervent prayers because nothing can stop effectual fervent prayers. It is our greatest weapon. Even though it may be the least used, it is our greatest weapon and we should use it more often. You should try it. Begin to pray. Begin to call those things that are not as if they were in the name of your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Jesus said in John chapter 14, verse 13 through 14, Whatever you ask in my name, this I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. Begin to intercede. Begin to prophesy into your situation. Prophesy this. Live. Live, dry bones. Live. Begin to proclaim the word of God. 
Shut the promises that you were given and see that investment that seemed to have died a natural death begin to breathe again. Remember the seed that you sowed so long ago. You almost forgot about it. It's about to sprout. It's about to grow. You know the relationship that you've been praying about at home? Well, that relationship is about to be restored. But remember this. The enemy knows that it's your harvest time. So do not let him steal your harvest. Don't give up. Just because the enemy has come down with great wrath, we wanted to steal and to destroy your harvest. You are a mighty warrior. Believe it, even if no one else believes it. Live it, even if you don't feel it. God believes in you. So believe in yourself because he has given you great and mighty promises. Believe it. This, we live in the grace of Almighty God. He has given you the most effective weapon, intercessory prayer. God will be in the wrestling match with us if we but pray, if we but seek His face. So, I don't know what you might be going through today. I don't know what you might be experiencing this morning. But effectual, fervent prayers availeth much. That I do know. So I want to ask you this story. Or I want to ask you this, this question. Do you know Jesus? Are you going through a hardship? Do you know Jesus? Is the devil coming against you? Are you getting your harvest steal, stolen? Do you know Jesus? Jesus is the only one who can help us defeat the enemy. Jesus is the only one who can restore your harvest. So it's imperative that you know who Jesus is. If you don't know who Jesus is, pray this prayer with me if you would like to know him. If you would like to have him in your wrestling match, pray this prayer with me. Heavenly Father, forgive me of my sins. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for dying on the cross for me. Thank you for offering me the gift of life. Thank you for lavishing salvation upon me. I receive it now with a glad heart. Help me to live for you. Help me to have faith to fight the good fight. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Amen. If you pray that prayer, the Lord is faithful and just to forgive you of your sins and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. What I want you to do is to get a Bible. Whether you have to go buy one or if you have one at home, take it out. Begin to read it. Start, start in the New Testament, start in the Old Testament. Just begin to read. Read the Word of God because the Word of God is alive and active. Begin to read it. Memorize it. Highlight those promises. Get a highlighter, highlight them. The other thing I want you to do is to find yourself a Bible-believing church that still believes in holiness, that still believes in righteousness, that still believes that there's a way to walk. It's a right way and a wrong way. Not one of those progressive churches that, that embraces the things of the world and embraces all of the, 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 the cultural changes. God never changes. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And He is a righteous, holy God. He wants us to be righteous and holy. And that is what we strive towards. So find a church that believes in that, who will disciple you, who would help you to grow. Work in that church. And when Jesus comes back, He'll find you doing what it is that you're supposed to be doing. And He'll say, well done, my good and faithful servant. And He'll take you to be with Him, that where He is, there you shall be forever and ever. No more sorrow, no more pain, no more heartaches. But just beautiful blessfulness with our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Well, as usual, I want to say thank you so much for joining me. I appreciate you joining me Sunday after Sunday. I, I love you, 
and I really appreciate you. My name is Kenny Yates. This is Hold the Hope. Be blessed and stay blessed.